Today, um, Pastor Layman's still unaccounted for, uh, <laughs> somewhere between Alaska and here, I guess. Uh, and I'm Pastor Jim Witt, who is one of his friends and was very happy to be asked to, to serve you this week. Our service today is going to follow the order that you find printed outside the worship folder that outline will follow the page 15 order of, of common service. We welcome those who are watching at home or will watch this. Uh, later online after it's uh, archived, and may God bless you all today as we consider the the important question of uh, our our allegiance and love and loyalty to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who saved us at the cost of His own life and loves us more than life itself. God bless you as you worship. We continue with our opening hymn number four seventy one. <laughs> Continue on page 15 in the front part of the hymnal. 
We gather as God's people this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. As a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now in the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Joshua told all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has said. 
Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly and faithfully. Remove the gods that your father served in the region across the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if you see no benefit in serving the Lord, then choose for yourselves today whomever you will serve, whether the gods that your forefathers served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The people responded by saying, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord in order to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is our God. He is the one who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, where we were slaves. He is the one who performed those great signs right before our eyes and protected us on the whole journey that we made and among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out of our presence all the peoples and the Amorites who were living in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. This is our first lesson. Our psalm for today is Psalm, 9, uh, psalm 71 on page 92. We'll sing the psalm in unison today. Having no stain or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but so that she would be holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands have an obligation to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. To be sure, no one has ever hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, of his flesh and his bones. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. This is the word of our Lord. Our response to this is Psalm, hymn 506. We'll sing all the stanzas. Jesus asked the twelve, 
You do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. demonstrates 
whether he really has the courage and skill that it takes. And as you might guess, some bullfighters have it and some don't. El momento de verde. In English, it's translated the moment of truth. And it's a fitting term to describe crucial situations in our lives. Situations where something precious is at stake that requires a bold decision or a skillful action on our part. It may be serving as a juror on a difficult criminal trial or seeing someone drowning out in the lake and knowing that you can save them if you take the risk. Deciding on whether to have a risky but potential, potentially helpful surgery. Confronting someone who is a danger to themselves or to others. Or asking that gal if you want to marry her, if, if she'll marry you and, and her decision to say yes or no to you. There are many situations that would fit the term the moment of truth in a person's life. But it is especially applicable to the spiritual and the eternal aspects of our lives. For example, El Momento de Verde is a fitting term to describe what it was like for the followers of Jesus after he gave the Bread of Life discourse in John chapter 6. Jesus had said a number of strange and surprising things about himself, that he was the one God sent from heaven to be the savior of sinners and the source of eternal life for people. Jesus also made the startling announcement that people were to recognize and receive him more as more than a great rabbi or a great prophet who had God's favor or someone who could perform miracles. Jesus summoned people to recognize and receive him as nothing less than the Christ, who was the Lord God himself and on a mission of salvation. How the people responded would be for them a matter of eternal life or eternal death, a moment of truth. When Jesus spoke those words, people had to take them in and consider what was at stake. Would they realize the divine truth of what Jesus was saying to them? Would they acknowledge the powerful evidence that pointed to Jesus as the Son of the Most High God and the Bread of Life? Would they carefully consider the testimony of the great miracles he had performed that pointed to his divinity? Would they honestly trust the truthful words he spoke that the Holy Spirit was now persuading them to believe as he was working in their hearts? Would they personally embrace Jesus as their Savior sincerely, as their God-sent Savior and Lord? Would they respond as they should at this critical, decisive time? What would they do with their moment of truth? These are questions not only for the people back then, but also for us as we consider Jesus and face our spiritual moments of truth. A large number of the curiosity seekers had already expressed their opinions about Jesus. They thought that Jesus' claims were outlandish and unacceptable to them. And so they turned away and they left. When they realized that Jesus was not going to be instituting a welfare program to provide for their physical needs by continuing to give them bread and fish day after day, well, they just didn't care to hang around. All they wanted was some physical benefit from Jesus, some nice, comfortable, earthly conditions from him. They foolishly dismissed the notion that Jesus could give them far more that Jesus could give them greater blessings that would thrill their souls and secure their eternal future. Now it was getting down to those who had a stronger interest in Jesus and who had demonstrated some level of commitment to following him. What would the response be of those who remained? Jesus tells us, or John tells us, excuse me, 
Many of Jesus' disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Their response indicated that they were not really buying what Jesus was saying. They would accept Jesus as a great teacher with special connections to God, but they would not accept him as their Lord and Savior. This was their momento de verde. They were being directly confronted with truthful testimony and the honest evidence of Jesus' works. And sadly, their response was disappointing. They refused to believe when the testimony indicated that they should. They were failing at their moment of truth. Jesus tried to help. He offered his help. He asked them the question, does this offend you? A literal translation from those, the Greek would be, does this scandalize you? In other words, Jesus said to them, as he says to us, are you letting your sinful pride and your unspiritual short-sightedness limit what you are seeing in me? Are you letting your stubborn pride cause you to fall into the devil's deadly trap of unbelief? You've been given plenty of proof, but you're not following the proof. More proof will come as I continue in my mission. You can see more and more evidence. God's life-giving spirit is at work through my words to ignore the spirit's persuasive testimony of the truth and to judge me by mere worldly human standards is useless and worthless. I, Jesus, am offering you the opportunity and the ability to enjoy eternal life right here and now. And still some of you will not believe. No one can come to me in their own power and on their own terms. <clears throat> Anyone can come to me with the ability that God the Father provides for you. Jesus' plea for them to reconsider their rejection largely fell on spiritually deaf ears and hearts. We are told, from this time, many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer followed him. The thousands of followers Jesus had before had become hundreds of followers. And now the hundreds of followers would become just dozens. Many people walked away from Jesus and they no longer confessed their allegiance to him. In their personal moments of truth, they would not accept the divine truth the Holy Spirit was presenting to them. And so they failed in the great thing, the one great thing that God wanted them to succeed in. They did not believe in Jesus as the God sent bread of life and Savior. Many people left the company of Jesus that day. They declared their disappointment in him and they returned to their old ways of life. Some likely never gave Jesus much serious thought after that. Many people left, but not everyone. Some remained. Jesus turned to the twelve. He turned to those close disciples who had traveled with him all the time. He asked them, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And the way that Jesus asked that question, he was expecting the answer to be no. No, Jesus, we don't want to leave you. And as it turned out, that's the answer he received. The twelve disciples and the others with them responded quite differently than the others had. Speaking of for the twelve, St. Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. These followers of Christ were not going to leave, even though others did. By the mercies of God, they set aside their natural resistance and refusal of God's truth and love. They accepted the testimony, and they accepted the evidence. They were convinced. They had to go someplace for spiritual truth and life, and they realized that Jesus was the only one to go to for that. 
They recognized him as the Holy One of God, the perfect Lord of heaven, who had come to earth to seek and to save them in their sinfulness. They respected Jesus' words as true. His words gave them eternal life. Their minds were made up. They had been convinced by the facts. It didn't matter if everyone else walked away. They knew the truth, and they were staying. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us our personal moments of truth about Him, too. He exposes us to His wonderful works and words. He explains their meaning and their importance to us. And along with that, He sends His Holy Spirit to testify to our hearts and minds and to persuade us to believe in Him. Many people in our world continue to foolishly ignore and refuse Jesus as so very many have done in the past. But there are those who believe and continue to believe and to remain with Him. There are those who refuse to follow the crowd and insist on following the Lord. What about us? What will we do? God makes the truth about Jesus very clear. He gives us ample evidence in His Word that He is the God-appointed Savior. He makes it known that it's Jesus who's come to serve us as no one else has, to give us perfect obedience, a sin-removing death, and a victorious resurrection that can rescue us. To ignore His saving power, to refuse to acknowledge His love, is dishonest and sadly deadly. Under the Spirit's persuasion and the Father's enabling, may we follow Peter and others who believed and continue to believe. May God give us His grace to realize that Jesus has the words of eternal life, that He is the only one to whom we can and must go, the one who says, I will never turn you away if you come to me. And then let us follow Jesus in our thankful obedience, in our joyful worship, in our willing service, and in our loving witness to Him. May we join with many others who have said, Lord of life, you have convinced us. And so we will stay close even when others walk away, and we will speak up even when others stay silent. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him that you will overflow with hope by the power of his spirit. Amen. Please rise now as we continue on page 20 to join in singing the created me.
And now please rise as we continue with our prayers for the church. We pray, Lord of power and grace, your eyes are on the righteous and your ears are open to their cry. Hear the prayer of your people who now come in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, Lord, that you provide us with life, breath, and being, and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all of our hearts. Learn from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness and follow him faithfully our whole life long. Grant us, your Holy Spirit, that we may produce the fruits of righteousness, be endowed with unwavering faith, so that we may always be ready to do your will. We pray for the nations of the earth, subdue terror and tyranny everywhere. We especially pray for the people of Afghanistan who are going through extreme hardships at this time. We pray that you will provide peace and safety for people in peril. And we also ask you to call forth leaders who will acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land. May it ever follow that which is good and turn from all that which is wicked, that our people may prosper in rightness and integrity. Hear, O Lord, our cry for those who are afflicted, those who are going through difficult times and hardships, those who are hospitalized or lonely, Grant them health in body and soul, and save them for your mercy's sake. And now hear us, Lord, as we come and bring you our private petitions. Guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world, and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus Christ our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We also pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life that, it ought, that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <laughs> with believing hearts who are God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.